the defender, on guard near the Iron Curtain, here to stand as a forceful symbol of Western determination. Forceful because Usurer, the United States Army in Europe, backs him up with the devastating might of its combat arms, the show of strength which was so dramatically unfolded in part one of the Usurer story. But the support of a sentinel is evident in a variety of other ways. Special forces vigorously trained to operate in a variety of unconventional ways. Air defense weapons constantly searching the sky. The welcome backup of Allied power from such brave men as the Bersaglieri combat troops of Italy. And logistical support, scientifically processing tons of supplies. This in part two of the Usura story. The United States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. The stature of an army is increased by the example of its leaders and men, by its professionalism. Every day in Bavaria, Germany, men of the 10th Special Forces hone a precise cutting edge to their combat skills and survival techniques. American fighting men have traditionally matched courage with ingenuity to win what seemed unwinnable battles with implements as stark as bare hands and the weapons of a primitive people. In every climate, over every type of terrain, special forces soldiers pit their endurance and skill against the hazards of special warfare. It is in the training that skills and endurance are tested to meet the demands that any mission would require. Every method of infiltration known to man is part of the special forces training, practiced and refined until performed with near perfection. Once in simulated enemy territory, the men learn how to rendezvous with friendly guerrilla forces. Lesson number one, speak their language. The operational element of special forces is a 12-man detachment and in itself practically the nerve center of an army with a spectrum of skills ranging from training and controlling friendly guerrilla forces to demolitions, communications, languages and medicine. They know their basic weapons inside out and are trained to use a variety of foreign arms. The rifles, pistols, machine guns and other weapons most likely to be seized or used by guerrilla forces. The alliance between guerrilla troops and special forces soldiers grows in a climate of learning learning to recognize, operate, and maintain the basic implements of war. Learning to use whatever resources are at hand. Improvising, 
taking materials, such as fertilizer, to produce the explosives that tomorrow will destroy a key enemy bridge, a rail line, a road. Learning to use all types of equipment, which can then be given to guerrilla teams for use in disseminating information. For this is also a contest for the minds of men who are directly involved in a clash of ideologies. Another backup for Usura's Border Sentinel, loudspeaker and leaflet companies, psychological warfare experts, who, like the special forces, are concerned with the minds of men. In the hands of a Psy War specialist, loudspeakers and microphones become virtual launching pads for one of the most effective missiles in use today, words. Words and images, man's artistic weapon in the delicate war of ideas and political structures. A Psy War leaflet, dropped by aircraft or artillery, can make a silent but powerful invasion of the enemy camp. Signal Corps specialists, too, are on hand, extending the ground combat soldier's ability to communicate under any condition. Engineer mapping teams, ready to keep our fast-moving soldier graphically informed of his day-to-day -day whereabouts on a changing battlefield. Weather platoons, with their scientific techniques of collecting meteorological data for use in training or in combat. Medical units, with their ability to function amid the pressures of battle. Mobile ordnance units, quickly replacing entire components, thus enabling man and equipment to continue the mission. Usura's engineers, spanning in minutes what once would have been impassable terrain, keeping the might and the men of an army pressing forward. The air defense artillery, complementing the air power of other services and allies with the compact and lethal Hawk, a low-altitude missile, rugged, extremely mobile. And the higher-altitude Nike Hercules, crew and weapon responsive to simulated attack. The crews operating these weapons maintain top proficiency by actual firing on ranges in the United States. The missiles are not to be fired in Europe except in response to an actual enemy attack. With attack always a possibility, the crews undergo alerts every day of the year, at any hour, day or night, each man performing his mission calmly but swiftly. When missile control specialists prepare for simulated firings, every move of hand, every glance at equipment is the result of in-depth training. These men know their jobs. They must. With the advancing complexity of our modern weapon systems, the leader is one of our most effective instruments of strength, the non-commissioned officer the man with the stripes. In Munich, Germany, Usura operates a complete school for the man with the stripes. 
the Seventh Army's non-commissioned officer academy, where leadership training is a dedicated way of life. Instruction here bespeaks the caliber of Usura's intensive training throughout Europe, schooling that grooms each man according to his maximum abilities for any mission asked of him. The training aid. These are very two uh, very good comparisons that we can use. Hi, now I've been using this training aid, this word training aid, quite a bit now. In your own words, what is your definition of the word training aid? Specialist? Specialist Carmine, suit number 74, to assist the instructor. Okay, good. What is your definition of a training aid? Specialist? Sergeant Connors, 281. Anything to help the instructor? Oh. All right, now that we know what a training aid is, we ought to find out exactly what are the different types of training aid. Let's take a look at these training aids. The NCO Academy takes the leader out of the classroom and plants him firmly into the mock reality of combat. A wrong order, a command executed too late, can in actual combat be the difference between life and death. The man with the stripes knows this and trains accordingly. Rest assured, these soldiers, with disciplined performance of mission, have well earned the title Leaders of Men in War and in Peace. West Berlin, a city besieged encircled by potential aggressor forces. A sentinel is on duty here, too, a mainstay of the USERA team defending the American sector of this divided city. Ironically, the Soviet war memorial stands in West Berlin, its honor guard the only Russian troops this side of the Iron Curtain. From the point of vantage of a West Berlin Polizei, this is the wall, a barbed wire and concrete exclamation point, reminding us of just how precious freedom really is and why it must be defended. West Berliners know what it means to have their city split in two, to be literally walled off from places where they perhaps played as children. They know, too, what it means to have to look over a communist wall into East Berlin in order to see a friend or loved one. Yet, there is a tone of optimism in West Berlin, due in large measure to the determined stand of the soldiers defending this city, the British, the Americans, and the French. The free world's team in this city maintains a status of complete readiness. West Berliners respond to that readiness. How do you do? We are a German family living in the American sector of West Berlin. This is our house here, and we are sitting in our backyard enjoying the nice summer weather. I am Mrs. Joachim. This is my husband. This is Sabine, my 10-year-old daughter. And this is Martin, he's six years old. Mrs. Joachim, how do you feel about the wall that has been built by the communists? Well, to tell you the truth, at first I was a little bit disturbed, like many other Berliners were, I'm sure. And as a mother of two children, I was worried too, because everything looked so, like, so much like war. But now that the Americans here in West Berlin reinforced their troops, and, and were deployed along the border, I feel very much at ease. In West Germany, as in West Berlin, Usura is not alone. Sintag, the Central Army Group of NATO, is made up of French, West German, and American elements working and training together. The French give us a sampling of the training that goes on within the Central Army Group Command.
And farther north in Germany, the West German Bundeswehr shows us the readiness of Northang, the Northern Army Group, commanded by British General Sir James Castles. Troops of West Germany, Canada, Belgium, Britain, and the Netherlands fused together into a mighty element of the Western Alliance. And to the far south, in Italy, where we witness a continued strengthening of the Alliance. Usura teams join forces with the Italians, affording their mixed units an opportunity to learn new approaches to tactical situations. Our soldier in Italy is part of CTAF, the Southern European Task Force, whose mission it is to have ready the ground-delivered atomic support for defense of Northern Italy. The corporal guided missile, ready to deliver its warhead, long range with pinpoint accuracy against any would-be invader. The Honest John rocket is here too, a short-range ground defense weapon operated by Italian troops who've been well-trained by American crews. But the power and the strength of our forces in Europe is meaningful only when matched with a spirit of allied trust and cooperation. Italian troops, such as these Alpini soldiers, bear witness to America's cooperative spirit in the pursuit of allied unity. Alpini troops frequently team up with Usura men for combat training exercises. The Alpini are among the world's finest mountain fighters, each a native of the mountain regions, each a man's man. Here, soldiers of Usura's engineer battalions work closely with the Alpini on a demolition training assignment. Here's but a small sample of the Alpine soldiers' preparedness. Still another of Italy's host of colorful troops, the Bersaglieri, or sharpshooters, a brave group of men that any man would welcome beside him in battle. found an esprit, a sense of purpose. Italian carabinieri, their dress uniforms reflecting a century and a half old tradition of fighting prowess. Even in such formidable company as this, Usura's young soldier, in a dress uniform of a different cut, but enwrapped with a comparable tradition, maintains his proud stance of defense. At a school high in the Alps, Usura ski troops have the unique opportunity to train under the guidance of the very best Italian experts. It looks like fun, and it is. 
but serious business, because a fall, a miscue in battle, could be fatal. Naples, Italy. Vicenza. Pisa. Names and places out of a colorful tour guide book. But they also signify the strategic military sites, the logistical and missile commands of Usura's Italian defense net. Perhaps one of the most scenic locales of all is Verona. And it is here that we find the headquarters for the Southern European Task Force, the focal point of our army in Southern Europe. Now let's listen to what this young Italian woman thinks about the American soldier in Italy. Scusi, signora. Si? Lei parla inglese? Oh, yes, I speak English. Oh, you speak it quite well. I represent the big picture United States Army television program for American audiences. We'd like to ask you a few questions about American forces stationed in Italy. Do you mind? Oh, not at all. First, tell us your name and something about yourself. Well, my name is uh, Mirella Vigliani. I am married and live here in Verona. Signora Vigliani, what do you think about the American forces stationed here in Italy? Most Italians uh, think it is a necessity to have them here in Italy as part of the NATO Organization for Defense. And uh, we realize that we are so close to the communist countries that we do hope that the NATO strength will prevent any aggression from the communists. And what do the Italians in general think of the American soldiers? Well, you see, a large majority of uh, Italians have relatives in the States, and a large percentage of uh, American people have uh, relatives here in Italy. And therefore, we feel such a close rapport between Italy and America that uh, we prefer American people to other peoples in the world. That's very kind. What do you personally think of the American soldiers? Oh, I like them very much. I had the opportunity to visit their homes since my neighbors are all American families and I'm having a wonderful time in seeing all the different customs and the way of living. Well, thank you very much, Signora Villani, for your answers. They're both interesting and informative. From Italy to France to Calm Z, Communication Zone Europe, for the little known story of a phenomenal support operation, logistics, the massive challenge of supplying the combat soldier with his clothing, his fuel, his weapons and ammunition. From Z in France, supplies move in a steady progression to our bases in West Germany. Millions of tons of every imaginable commodity, transported by a variety of means. Trailers, packed in the States, never unloaded till they reach their final military destination. With that ingenuity, so long an American tradition, the Army developed a system of quick disconnect techniques that speedily unhitches the tractor from the trailer. Then a smooth and quick exchange of one tractor for another, one tired, the other fresh. The trailer becomes a veritable Pony Express on wheels. With minimum delay en route, they go, night and day. The COM-Z supply network is kept operating smoothly by the modern miracle of electronics, automatic data computers, with their micro-miniaturized, bepuzzling decks of equipment, constantly sifting out the thousands of orders from the field, getting the supplies shipped without delay. An army that moves is an army with trucks and tanks and armored personnel carriers, with complete families of vehicles and aircraft, 
every one of them with a healthy appetite for fuel. So, from the coast of France to the depots of West Germany, the pipelines and supply trucks of ComZ answer the need, carrying the product to the consumer. Fuel of all kinds, jet fuel, aviation gas, diesel oil, gasoline, fuel, the largest item of supply in the entire ComZ system. Simultaneously, other commodities are transported by water to their military destinations. The big items, the guns and vehicles and aircraft of an army. The hardware and supplies that keep our usurer soldier at a constant peak of readiness wherever he may be. This is the way to back up a border sentinel. With everything you've got. And now, from Usera headquarters in Heidelberg, Germany, the man who knows as much about Usera as a man can know, the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army in Europe, General Bruce C. Clark. We don't want you to think for a moment that we are preoccupied with only guns and tanks and equipment of war. On the contrary, Usera fosters a large, highly successful educational program through accredited schools. And religion, too, is a vital part of our lives. We like to feel we are a religious army. Usurer has constructed 253 chapels throughout Europe for its troops. Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish services are conducted regularly, as well as Sunday school classes and group meetings. We have given you a very brief sketch of Usurer's mission, its proficiency, and its strength. When NATO was first organized, there were many who believed it could never be made to work. Helping make NATO work has been a challenge well met by the United States Army in Europe, the strongest ground force in NATO. In the strange half war we are in, you have well met the challenge to our freedom, our way of life, and the strength you have given usurer. 